We are continuing our discussion about work-based education with some, some new revelations. And, and Jaime, let's start with you. Uh, the board's come up with some money to help uh, apprenticeship programs. Yes, because of all the reasons that we've uh, discussed here today, in addition to the annual allocations that our board makes to, to uh, help youth achieve these goals, this year specifically the, the Workforce Connections Board has decided to set aside $1 million to invest in pre-apprenticeship activities. And this will allow youth the opportunity to uh, learn as they earn and they will be able to uh, be on construction sites and learn to be exposed to all of the trades and hopefully this will be a talent pipeline that will feed the apprenticeship programs and elect electrical carpentry and so on. What is pre-apprenticeship and how does it differ from differ from apprenticeship for yeah. example? Very good question. So again that, that's a word that a lot of people uh, you know have different views on mm -hmm. but I think that the, the simplest way to, to think about it is uh, a lot of times apprenticeship programs, they have certain minimum requirements. And so, uh, for example, passing an eighth grade math test. And so pre-apprenticeship activities give you, uh, fill the gap, if you will, that sometimes exists. We've discussed today the gap of skills that exist to be uh, work ready. And so pre-apprenticeship activities can, can do that. They're specific uh, to, to fill the gaps needed in order to be able to be ready for apprenticeship programs. Well, there's an additional thing, uh, some people are not very good at passing tests. But that doesn't mean they cannot be a good workers. Mm -hmm. And there's a certain skill set, even in electrical industry, does not necessarily require you to be a math uh, be in, uh, wizard. And uh, so, so the um, boot camps that we're creating is basically taking people out of the industry without testing. We're just taking for the attitude. And if they have a good attitude, they become good workers. Are they gonna be, the supervisors or management in later life, it's not necessarily that important. They, but they still could be a good workers and make a good living. And How, uh, one question, and then I'll get right back to you, Manny. So can Helix apply for uh, the work connections, part of the million dollars? Yeah, to... yes. So, the... Yeah, that, uh, that's a question I had. How do you, <laughs> how do, you do that? Because, right. because up to date, we have funded, self-funded all of our programs, and we, this year we're up to almost four hundred thousand dollars in in money that we spend um, training uh, people in the labor force. Yeah, the simple answer is any employer, any nonprofit, any for-profit, any government agency is uh, eligible to apply for these funds. And all you have to go is to go to our website, to nvworkforceconnections.org. Okay, Manny, I'm sorry. No, I was going to say that a high-quality pre-apprenticeship program is connected to an apprenticeship program. And the reason for that is, as Jaime was alluding to, is that it provides you the prerequisites, right, to be successful. So we're not training for the sake of training, but we're training to a specific means. So that's just one important kind of technical nuance that a pre-apprenticeship, a high quality one, is connected to an apprenticeship program so that the individuals that you're training have access um, and entry. And that's actually recognized. And there's different models, for example, Youth Build, which is recognized by U.S. Department of Labor as a quality pre-apprenticeship. Because there's, again, there's that direct connection, providing you the prerequisite, whether it's the on-the-job learning, um, the education component where you're filling in the gaps to prepare you to be full-on um, apprenticeship, registered apprenticeship. Let's talk legislative policy. Okay, the legislature meets uh, next year, early next year. What's on the wish list for you guys? What, what would you like to see we done different? We would like to see, because of shortage of labor, because of our economy growing and we cannot fulfill those needs, we like to see some, uh, some funds available for training. There is a lot of things legislation uh, provides funds to attract businesses to come to Nevada to open the thing with certain criteria. There should be similar funds available for companies who are willing to train their people and, and take that leap and do things uh, um, uh, what we're doing today, self-funding self it. One thing I would add is the existing policy infrastructure that's already in place to build on that's successful. Um, there's three core policies for workforce. One is Senate Bill 66. That was actually introduced by the Department of Education. We work closely with them. It's a work-based learning bill. Um, one, of the one of the components of Senate Bill 66 and what it means for Nevadans is that school districts um, have a work-based learning coordinator. And if you reach out to, for example, if you're you know, Clark County, for example, you would reach out to, you know, Craig Brockett. If you're in Northern Nevada, or Kerry Larnard. If you're in Northern Nevada, Dr. Dana Ryan. 
but it allows school districts to have a work-based learning coordinator. Senate Bill 516 is actually the bill that created our office as an apprenticeship. It restructured apprenticeship where we have additional resources to expand apprenticeships in the state where we have a state apprenticeship director. We have um, a council, a diverse state apprenticeship council to scale and create an apprenticeship program. And the last really quick one is Senate Bill 19. It's a dual enrollment, dual credit bill. It was actually introduced by the governor's office. It was passed and it allows students to, again, expand the opportunities for young adults to get that dual credit. And the reason why that's important is pre-apprenticeship is a great example. If you have a student, let's say they're in 12th grade or let's say they're um, going through a training program, now if you're connected to the post-secondary system where that education and the employer is having that conversation, that students can gain credit for that learning, for that training that they're going through, through um, um, and that builds on stacks upon the education that they're already um, pursuing. So Renee, do you have a wish list? For instance, uh, would you like to have more access to employers? Uh, is there something that can yep. be done legislatively that would help your organization? You know, uh, definitely. One of the things that, that we find is that, you know, in working in with K-12, we're embedded within it, mm -hmm. is very often you have different systems that are almost siloed. I would like to see more of a tearing down, you know, ways legislatively and policy-wise to tear down walls to allow employers to come into the workplace, to allow uh, expanded dual credit opportunities and CTE opportunities, you know, for young people uh, as an investment, you know, in Nevada itself. When you invest, invest in young people, you know, having a set of technical skills, you're really investing in your own economy. So our hope would be to see just more of a tearing down of the walls, more of an emphasis on practical skills, more of an emphasis on connecting what you learn with what is really out there. Very often when kids are disengaged, they talk about uh, what is it that, that their learning is not relevant. It's boring because it's not relevant to the real world. So if we make it relevant to a career and to their own lives, then it can be more impactful. The walls you talk about, are those um, government policy walls or are they company policy walls or is it a combination of both? I think you have, you have large systems and structures in place and uh, just as an example, we're embedded in the schools, you know, through MOUs, and we have wonder co wonderful cooperation from the districts. But you know, at times there are, you know, there are barriers to being an outsider going into the school system, where uh, I think as a, you know, I could name some examples, but you know, in essence, we cannot access the same things. Uh, for example, uh, some of our specialists in, in one Nevada county were unable to uh, sit on the floor with their graduates because they were not an employee of, of the school district, whereas they were the person who got them through the finish line. Renee, uh, can I so that's add a small thing. Can I have one important thing, which is sure. one way, so I would say it's a combination of both, but AB7, which is the College and Career Readiness Diplomas, I believe in a previous show it was uh, discussed before, I think it was even passed, um, but the College and Career Readiness Diploma, if there's something I would say, and we see this in the government mm -hmm. side, which is that we don't often have funding to talk or mark, share the information that we're doing because we want to focus on the services, but that's something I don't think that's widely known by business um, or even education as widely, so we're, we're collaborating. So AB7, and this is really, I think it's a phenomenal effort by the Nevada Department of Education and the school districts where students can earn college and career readiness diploma endorsements. And so all of the stuff that we're talking about, such as work-based learning and industry-recognized credentials, now the incentive system is switched in a good way so that now students, educators, principals, could be incentivized so that students that are pursuing industry recognized credentials can add that to their diploma. And that's, I think, is the, where we close the gap, where we structure mm -hmm. our incentive system to uh, pro pursue something that we know that's important for the workforce. Let's talk success, success stories, if we will. The goal of your office is to have 55,000 more young adults completing some for, form of work-based education by the year 2025, I believe. Right, yep. How are we doing reaching that goal? Yeah, good question. So um, when we see on apprenticeship side, actually, we've seen a 40% increase in the registered apprenticeship uh, participants um, in the past year alone, and we'll be producing a report to share that information. Um, what we're working to expand, though, is the piece around like the internships or the pre-apprenticeship that's more aligned with the young adult population. And when people hear the 55,000 number, they're like, oh my goodness, that's a big number. But yeah. if you actually break it down, it's about 78,000 per year. Um, that's actually about only 25% of the students, right? So it's not as lofty, as, I think, as um, unattainable. I think if we put our resources together, engage with each other, it's definitely um, attainable to reach. 
I think I'd like to add one more thing, and I think you're right with regard to the diploma. Um, if we could incorporate more technical skills training like CTE in more schools, mm -hmm. You know, I was thinking of CompTIA A, A plus as an example, which is, uh, You're you on know, the list. well, it's, it's the basic step into, you know, IT help desk type okay. work. And if you look at that, rather than waiting until someone graduates, if we could incorporate more of those types of stackable credentials in the high school, uh, you would have young people who could graduate high school, make 15 or $16 an hour, and, and continue their education. You know, if you think about successful people, they work and they go to school. And so if we can foster that, the working and going to school, you know, I think we'll be, have more successful young and people. The Department of Education, and I know they'll be doing a lot more about this next year, and we've done it too, where we're actually paying for those certifications for, the young, for those young students if they're in a high demand um, area, and we have it on our site on the high demand industry recognized credentials list. Gentlemen, thank you very much. Very worthwhile discussion. Thank awesome. you so thank much. Thank you so yeah. much.